uh, they also say, oh no, you have a camera movement, so you cannot use mid painting. Or they say, oh no, this shot is in the stereo, so you cannot use mid painting. And these people are wrong. And what I, I will try to show you today is that with camera mapping and multiple projections, you can pretty much cover background elements, mid-ground elements, and even foreground elements easily and with photorealism. Uh, other people say that oh, my painting is cheating. It's not real 3D, so you are cheating. And these people is absolutely right. We cheat pretty much all the time. And you know what? Visual effects since the very beginning, 100 years ago, is all about that. It's all about tricking the eyes of the audience. So, Mid painters and the compositor guys, uh, I don't know if Sebastian is here or Bartek is here, if there are any other compositors here in this room. There is? Yes, you guys. So uh, we are the cheating guys of the production and we do this proudly because we just want, it's not personal, we just want to have the shot done. We just want to have time to have some, a couple of Belgian beers in the end of the day. So we cheat a lot proudly. So. Uh, Saying that, I will try to show you some difference between the two approaches, the made painting approach and the full 3D approach. Both are used a lot in production and they are not separate, uh, separated uh, entities, they, are, they mix together. And then we've seen this difference, we can figure out together what are the pros and cons of, of each approach. Uh, both use the same tools and have the same objective, that is to make uh, elements photorealistic and integrated them within a shot. Uh, in, a in full 3D, you start building full assets. So you model it, you shade it, you texture it, and then you distribute these full assets in a scene, and then you create an almost entire environment. In Medpenton, you create only what you see. You only take care of, what, of the elements that actually face your camera. So you create only what you see. Uh, in full 3D, it takes longer to reach a photoreal look. Uh, I'm pretty sure that there are some artists here in this room that can do it, uh, that can reach a photoreal uh, result in, in a full 3D scene in Blender. Uh, it's, it's not that you cannot do, it just takes longer uh, and sometimes takes more people. We have the modeling guy, the texturing guy, blah, blah, blah. And in matte painting, as it is based on photos, and photos are already photorealistic, if you have a good eye for integrating them, uh, you get faster to what makes a photoreal image. Uh, things like values, uh, relations between elements, uh, photoreal textures, contrast perspective, arrow perspective, you can tweak this faster. <laughs> but in Nafu 3D, you just point your CG camera anywhere and click render and you wait a lot because renders take longer or you submit your work to our friends at Render Street they are great guys, I don't know if they are here. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and this is great because what you create becomes independent. You can use it across multiple shots or across multiple sequences. So this is great. In the other hand, Matte Painting is extremely shot specific, shot oriented. You see your shot, you plan what you need to do and you put effort on that specific area of that specific shot. Of course you can uh, use something that you painted for one shot in another shot, but this is not the idea of my painting. So, uh, in my painting, changes and turnovers can be faster, like, okay, changes mountain. You just grab another mountain and uh, uh, color correct it and uh, integrate this and it's done. But if your camera movement changes drastically, if your director uh, gets crazy, oh no, oh, no, I want another camera, you get killed. Simple, like that. In full 3D, the changes and turnovers take longer because you have to tweak everything, pretty much everything, but you hardly get killed. So if you, we can compare the both uh, methods, I, I could say that uh, uh, full 3D is like a big gun, a big cannon, a bazooka, that it's harder, but it's effective. And uh, matte painting is like, more like a small knife, like a, an, an, an opinel knife. That um, it, with a carbon blade that you calculate and you see what needs to be done and you go there and put effort on that, on that specific part and you get your shot done and you get your Belgian beers. So um, let's cook some mate painting. This is the basic recipe. 
the basic formula. If you follow this formula, is everything will be all right. No, it's not like that. Uh, and in, like in every CG area, uh, there's no formula. You can you have a lot of ways to do stuff. And this is even true in, with made painting, as it is shot specific. So you have to take your shot, see it, planning, the first step, planning, planning, plus planning, and see what needs to be done. And when I say planning, I say, uh, I, I say real planning. So build an animatic. Build an animatic with simple primitive cubes and see if your idea is working. Because if your idea is working with simple cubes, it's obviously, obviously that if you put effort on top of it, it at the end it will it still works and now beautifully. But if your animatic, animatic doesn't work or if you don't do an animatic, uh, it doesn't matter if you have 15 artists from Industrial Light and Magic working for you, at the end it will still not work. So plan your shot and build an animatic. After you build in an animatic and do your planning, you will see that matte painting is always a dance between uh, building geometry and painting on top of it, or having uh, something already painted or a photo and creating simple geometry just to project on top of it. You're always doing dancing with this, with these two girls in the party. Uh, so uh, after you have modeled your geometry and you have your camera movement from your animatic, you, define, you define the hero frames of your shot. And what are the hero frames? are the frames that uh, are the moment in the camera movement that your camera cover most of your scene. So you go to your camera movement and say, okay, I'm going to paint this computer. So this frame here is my hero frame. It's the, the frame that cover most of my scene. If you have a simple camera movement or if you have no movement in your camera, you will have only one hero frame. But once your movement starts to get complicated, you know, to see the side or the side, you have another, uh, more than one hero frames. So, with these hero frames, you duplicate your camera and you define your projection cameras. Okay, I'm going to have a projection camera here and a projection camera here. So, you go through this projection camera and you render out a clay render and several passes that will help you on your painting process. And then you go to an image editor, a GIMP or Photoshop, and you start painting on top of it. And you start dropping some photos, especially photos on top of it, and you start cheating and you try to make this photo real. This is where the magic happens for my painters. So you try to make an image that is photorealistic. So once you're done with your painting, you project this painting back onto your geometry from your projection cameras, and you fix issues that sometimes appear on when you connect your projections or, or when your projection don't cover a part of your object. And then you render, render out your animation with shaderless materials because now you have to be you, you want to be fast and you don't need more the lighting passes and, and the physically accurate stuff because everything is baked on your painting. And you render the separate separate on layers for any compositor. Here you can compositor shot and then you deliver a shot and go for your Belgian beers. So uh, the key study I will show you today uh, is um, a documentary that I work for, for History Channel Latin America. It's, um, Latin America. it's a documentary about the construction of the Panama Channel. And I was responsible for doing some, some matte paintings, some sky replacements, some set extensions. But there was one shot that I was responsible from the beginning uh, to deliver it to a compositor. So, and this one is what, what I will show you. Uh, my briefing. In the highest part of the channel, there is a big lake, and in this lake, there is a dam that controls the level of, of the lake. And the objective was to show that after a big earthquake, uh, the dam was still solid and still holding the immensity of Gatun's lake. So, uh, discussing with the director and with the supervisor, we, we, and building an animatic, we find out that the, the better, best way to, to do this is, uh, was to do an, an upwards traveling shot, uh, the beginning showing the dam from below and showing the immensity of the lake there. So uh, second step after planning and building an animatic was to get some reference images. For a made painter or for any artist, never is too much to have a lot of reference images. If you, if you can spend one day, two days, one week, 
searching for reference and you Google translate uh, the search words for other languages and you search in Portuguese, in Spanish, in English, in Russian and you get a bunch of reference images. Next step, modeling. Uh, I model based on a Google Earth photo and also when I was uh, searching for reference, I found this this project. Th this is the actual project of the, the dam from 100, um, 100 years ago. And it's important if you're going to project stuff that you model it uh, kind of based on the reality, like respecting the scale and the position of stuff. Because if you just do look into the to the to your hero shot, for example, to your hero friend, for example, you can place things out of position, and when your camera movement, raw, it gets distorted. So I model it. This is my rough model of the terrain and the dam. And with this, we imported the camera from the animatic, and we tweak it a little bit just to show things better. And we could define the camera movement so the upward traveling, and we could define the duration of the shot, that would be 800 frames, a lot for a shot, but okay. And we could define the hero frames, that in this case it's here, the first frame and the last frame. So um, we're going to have two projections, and we're going to have probably some patches to fix, some issues that will appear. So um, first step, we go through our projection camera, see our first hero frame, what we're seeing here, and we render out the clay render with the passes. You use cycles for that, because cycle is a physically render, accurate blah, 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 render, and it gives you great shadow passes, realistic shadows, and realistic lightning. So you render this out without materials, just a clay render, but with good lightning. So you have your shadows and your light nicely. So, uh, and you also export this as an EXR, and you export several passes that will help you to paint. Uh, so I have my clay passes here, my, some diffuse passes, some reflection passes for the for things that reflect, of course, for the water and the metal parts and the fence on top. Uh, I have some occlusion passes, uh, shadow passes, and also notice that uh, things that overlap on the camera movement, ob objects that overlap. I export it separately, like the fence and these blocks here and the, the, the walls and the grass, because I need to paint them separately and then project them separately in order to have uh, the appear right when they overlap on the command. Next step, uh, it's not the point of the presentation to see my painting process, so I did a quick uh, time lapse of painting this. I used Photoshop. Uh, it's important to work non-destructively with your sources. I mean, if you're gonna erase something, you use a mask. You don't erase. If you want. Can we dim the light across this? Oh, can we dim the light, please, my friend? Can we dim the light, please? Oh, it's just a quick time lapse. Okay. Uh, it's important to work non-destructively. If you're going, if you want to erase something, you use a mask. You don't erase. If you want to color correct something, you use adjustment layers. You, don't, you just don't uh, change the color because if you want to come back, it's good to have it. And it's important to work in the maximum depth of color you have. So I'm working on painting on 16 bits. Um, so uh, when I finish it, I come up with this image here. Uh, this is my final make painting for the hero frame number one. This is my first projection. This is not the point of this presentation to judge the quality of this image. I recognize that a, a senior made painter or a better made painter will, will, will reach this point with a better image. But this is what I did in, within my deadline. So uh, I did this also for the hero frame number two. But in this case, I, I, I didn't need shadows and light here. I just need a reference to paint on top. So I got an OpenGL render super fast. And I paint on top of it the last of the landscape with uh, the water and the forest and the sky is the same at, uh, on the first painting. And notice that I didn't paint the dam again because the dam will be projected on the first frame, so he will be here uh, anyway. So second, uh, next step, uh, export your, your matte painting into projection layers. I mean, um, 
everything that overlap, everything that need parallax will be exported in a separate layer. So I exported the sky, this cabinets here, the dam itself, it's, it was just in one projection layer, the columns and these towers here. Uh, the fence, the antenna, the walls, and the grass, and the power plant, there is a big house that is on the left, and the water. And for the second position as well, uh, the line of force number two, line of force number one, the water, and the sky is the same, so I don't know. Ah, the water. <coughs> this is nice. Uh, the water is actually footage that I shoot. I shoot real ocean in, near my house in Brazil. And then I stabilize it, it and I compose it on top of my painting. And then I, I exported with a great offer uh, an animated texture. And Blender uh, deals really well with animated texture, so I projected this image sequence where it's water. So let's back to Blender and set our projections. Uh, first, you duplicate your scene, because you have a modeling scene, now you're going to have a projection scene. Then you turn to Blender internal, Blender render, Blender internal render. Because now everything is baked on your painting, so uh, you want to be faster, you want better meters. So, Blender internal. Then you apply your, all your modifiers in, on your geometry, and you can join your objects, objects that belong to the same projection layer, uh, like the dam in this case, uh, the columns, the bridge here, the wall. I imagine in the same object, you can do it or, or not, but uh, I do this because it gets more organized. And then uh, you go through your projection camera in the hero frame, you see in your geometry, and you go to edit mode, super straight, press U, and then UV unwrap using project from view. And then your object will have the, the UVs prepared to receive a projection. Um, you can use the UV projector. Yes, you can, especially if you want to tweak your geometry on the go. And you can use project from bounds, I think it's this year, but when you use project from bounds, I think it scales the textures for the maximum UV space. I don't know how it works, but I get some issues. So I use project from view, it's straightforward. And if you want to change something, you just change it and go again, you project from view again, and so it's projected from that camera. And then you create a shadeless material, you have everything back, so it's shadeless. Just check here and forget about any setting on the material, it's shadeless. And then you go to the image texture tab and you assign a new texture. What texture is this? It's the, we're talking about the dam, it's the dam texture. Remember to use alpha, because you need the alpha. Uh, and you set the mapping coordinates to the UV map you've just created. Uh, use a consistent num name, not UV map, just like hero projection or something like that. And then you repeat this for all your projection layers, for all your objects on the scene. And then you, you, you will have set your first projection. Uh, and then you check your projections in your shot. Ah, this is uh, actually a, a print screen from, from my view port from OpenGL. And it looks great. It can also have been used for a shot if you want to put it. Uh, so you check your projections and you see that in some areas, there will be issues, like here, where you have this area here that uh, like a leak for the, the back, and you have some issues here, this is, I think is the pivot, but you have some issues, and you have to fix these issues. And why these issues occur? Because uh, of the nature of the geometry, there are some hidden areas here, like you have your camera here, and it, this creates a projection cone, and there are some areas of your geometry that don't catch projection. They, what they catch is this little thing, line of pixels. So this area here, you have to fix. So how you fix it? While you're doing matte painting, you will fix it doing matte painting. So you keep going with your camera, and you find a hero patch frame. I mean, a frame that covers most of your issues. You can even push back your camera a little bit, or you can even uh, wide open the field of view, just to cover more area. But be consistent, don't put this five kilometers away in paint because you're gonna have a, a resolution problem. So you find a hero patch frame and you render out a frame from, from this camera. And what you render will be something like that. And you see the issue here and here and here. And then you go back to your image editor, create a new layer and paint on top of that. And correct this 
and you can clone it or you can bring new textures or whatever and you fix it and once you fix it you're going to have something like this in a new layer and you export this as a new layer and you go back to your hero uh, patch camera and project this image again on top of your geometry you set a new projection on top of the same geometry and this is the trick so to do this you go again to your object, you go to this tab here, I don't know the name, it looks like a cow face, and uh, you create a new UV map. And once you create a new UV map, you name it properly, okay, this is, will be my patch frame, and then you go again to your, to your frame, to your camera, project from view again, add a new texture that will be your patch on the frame, and select that UV map that you created. And boom, you have two projections in the same object and your reshoot is corrected. So uh, what you have just done here, you set two projections, is a concept that once you understand that you can have like an object or uh, an environment and you can cover it with several cameras and you can paint uh, a matte painting or, or a photo and project it on top of it, I mean having multiple cameras projecting different made paintings or photos into different UV maps, you can cover pretty much background elements, mid-ground elements or foreground elements using mid painting. So we did the same for the second projection and finally we rendered out our animation with a super optimized render. We just need the textures and a good anti allies. Uh, you can use motion blur here or you can pass to the compositor as a vector or you can do both you can render a version with motion blur another version without motion blur mix them see what fits better and you'll render also separate by layers because the compositor need to tweak this after all and we come out with something like this if you can dim the light again oh you can see this is not the final shot but this is what i delivered for the compositor and this is pretty much an animation separated in layers in 16 bits. So the composite could uh, integrate this into the, um, into the show. So that's it for this shot. Uh, another quick example, this was a um, TV commercial for a brand, for a Brazilian shoes brand, and they did a collection with the sir here, Mr. Karl Lagerfeld, and uh, of course Karl Lagerfeld didn't show up in Brazil to shot the commercial, so they licensed uh, this photo, this photo, oh shit, okay, sorry, just a second, oh. uh, here, we had this picture here, and what I did was to create a simple cube here and a simple cube here and I did a quick sculpt, really quick sculpt with, uh, 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 how do you say, Dynamesh in Blender, poly dynamic, dynamic topology, which is great and fast and your mesh don't, don't get so heavy. And, um, you know there are some parts that are not correct, his chin is bended, but you know he has the chin bending in reality, it, it, and it works from my camera point of view, so it's great. And then I create a little scene setup and project my texture. And you can see here there are some issues on the side, but there's no problem because in my camera angle it works. So here is the shot, final shot. And uh, another quick example, uh, this is, was a personal project as well. This is a painting from Mr. James Gurney. This is in the book Dinotopia or Dinotopia, I don't know if you know, it's a great book. And I wanted to turn this into a shot, so I extended a little bit the concept here. I start modeling uh, some geometry for the gate. I use it as sphere for the, that uh, building behind, and then um, I use some planes behind for the, for the buildings. I paint it on top of it with textures, uh, use it a full 3D tree, and put some bolts and stuff like that. Ah, I defined my hero frames, hero frame number two, the end of the shot, hero frame number one on top, and then I composite everything. Ah, this ocean is 
Blender Ocean Simulation. It looks really nice. Some lighting passes, people, real people, composite on top. And this is the shot. Ah, uh, that's me. So, uh, that's it. Thank you Blender for being such a nice piece of software and more than this uh, for all the philosophy you have behind you and uh, I think uh, we can change the world with Blender. So thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions please, uh, I think you have time. If you have any questions, please. Yes, uh, some, sometimes I just, if, if it is easy uh, or, I don't know, I project two textures and uh, I just rotate my model and I can clone with, with Blender Texture and Painting Tools. It's super easy, yes, I do this often, yes, definitely, you can do it. Yeah, and once we have uh, the ability to, I think we have already, uh, but uh, the ability to use layers, Painting on layers and use uh, color modes like uh, multiply. It's in already now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, there's 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 a lot of new stuff that I, I haven't really tested. I must confess that uh, I cannot use Blender in all of my work because there are many studios that just laugh about using Blender and they, you cannot break their pipeline. Uh, but I try to use it. And I know that there are new features now that will help to, to, to improve the use of it. One of this, the features I, need, I want to test is the FBX export, because it's very important to export this geometry to Nuke or to other software. And it must be straight, OK, export to FBX, and you have to open this in Nuke, and your axis cannot be twisted, and stuff like that that happens today. So I must test this, and I hope this improves. Please. On what, sorry? On your clay model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, do you only use like the, uh, the, 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 the images from the reference shots, or do you also just use, for example, uh, a concrete texture? Which no, I, I mix it. I mix it concrete textures uh, or, mat or any material textures with photos, and uh, I try to take photos as well to provide the reference because. Uh, it's better, and also reference in 16-bit format, and uh, uh, that you can have all the range and stuff like that. But you can mix it, yeah. And it's a problem if you are mixing a texture with 8-bit with uh, an image with 16-bit. But normally you must take care of the sky and places that have uh, lower values or higher values, that because this is, is what will give you trouble after. Yeah. If you have a job to do. Uh, do you have a library of materials and photos, or do you uh, search the internet? I have a library, and I think every map painter should build your own library of stuff. And sometimes you you buy stuff, you buy photos, and uh, sometimes you go to the internet and ask permission for using it. Yeah. But uh, I, I, I'm building my own library. I like to, especially skies, it's good to have some photos in, in, in HDR because you can mix clouds and mix stuff. So it's good to have a good library of skies and forests or cities, stuff like that you can, you can go and okay, you do, find. You do, uh, make a lot of photographs. Yeah, yeah. And also know a lot of photography uh, allows you to know about lenses, about composition and stuff like that. So it's, it's important to be a good photographer, so I think, in my opinion. You have, you have another question? Yeah, how do you deal with, like, uh, when the reference image has shadows and such, but you don't want shadows, but your shadows are from the... Yeah, th this is most of my job, you know, relighting stuff. And uh, it's... Uh, not complicated process, you put an adjustment layer on top 
of everything and you build a mask on top of the shadow, for example, and then you color correct only that area so it matched with the unlit scene. So that's, that's why when you took reference photos, you, you must choose an, a cloudy day with the unlit light so you don't have hard shadows and hard lights. And for the sunny parts, the same. You build a mask and you color correct just on that mask. And this can take consume some time. Yeah. Please. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, in Blender especially. In Nuke, you can work with a plane with four vertex, but in Blender, you have to subdivide it. Especially in the corners, you have some weird issues, so you have to subdivide it, yes. But uh, as I said, you are always dancing between uh, painting and modeling, so sometimes if things are not uh, fitting, you push something or your vertex or geometry and you subdivide only that part and you try to deal. But yes, in Blender you have to subdivide a little bit your... But this is good because uh, the texture sticks pretty well on the, on the vertex and you have ways to, to, to tweak things on the go. Please. Did you ever run into problems with pre-multiplying pre alpha? Like yes. Are they just because I didn't see you uh, pre-multiplying the alpha? Yeah, on my composition, no, I just drop it on top. But this is problem for compositors. But yes, I have, I have issues, but uh, it's easy to get rid of it. Uh, you have to export your images with correct alpha, and uh, I usually I, I export uh, TIFFs with 16 bits, and they are exported uh, on a dark background or a white background, depending on what you need. And the compositors must get rid of the permute play. Yes, definitely. You, if you see the edges of my dam, there is like a bright. And yes, in the final shot, uh, it was so good. Uh, well. Yes, I have tried Krita and I have tried GIMP. I think that they are both tools, but uh, for but Photoshop for me is uh, it's like a glove for me. The same I can say about Blender. The interface uh, makes my life so much easier. I can model stuff really, really fast. And uh, I saw my colleagues at work blaming Maya for a lot of, for the viewport that doesn't work for the extrude f tool or anything. But I don't see them blaming Photoshop and Nuke, these two. Software is really solid and works very well, very very well. Yeah, I can. Me too. Me too. Sometimes uh, I think everybody can. Please. Yes, uh, that's what I said. Uh, I think Nuke is it's solid, and I, I use Blender Compositor as I said to deliver my shot, uh, just to see how things works quickly, but. Uh, once you start to get uh, uh, getting a lot of higher resolution footage, 4K footage or 8, 5K footage, and a lot of nodes, uh, it starts to get slow, and Nuke is super solid. And also, studios have their own pipeline. They have uh, scripts running with, uh, with F-Track and running together with Nuke, running together with 3D, and one thing has to feed another. So it's very difficult for them. Not difficult, but you know what? They everybody lives immersed in, in, into a, a commercial paradigm, and with students it's not different, and uh, it's very hard to make them see beyond. But uh, it's our job to change this, especially the artist. Um, yeah. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Sometimes it gets so fast because there are things that you are used to doing and sometimes...